Um, good afternoon. My name is Evgeny Dingup, and I'm happy to um, uh, moderate this first webinar this academic year. Before I uh, introduce you, um, our speaker, I would like to thank uh, Brandeis University, and particularly Rina Dubinina and uh, Eli Jacobson, who were kind enough uh, to provide the uh, equipment and uh, the, the software for this webinar. Um, so I think um, you should be able to see the screen and uh, uh, me and then um, And the way it will work, uh, we will um, uh, have the presentation, then we'll speak for about 50 minutes. Um, you have an option of uh, typing your question. Uh, you should see a Q&A button somewhere on your screen. It's either top or bottom. So please type your question and then um, I will let them know um, uh, if this question needs to be answered as he speaks or um, at the end of his talk, uh, we will uh, have a Q&A session. And so uh, we'll read the quest your questions uh, and then we'll answer as many as um, he can. Um, the uh, meeting is recorded and we will send the link to the recording to everyone who is registered for this webinar. And we'll also send a survey uh, to everyone uh, asking you for feedback and for topics for future webinars. We're very interested in your opinion and hearing what you would like to know uh, uh, through this webinar series. So um, now, let me just say a few words about our, our presenter. Uh, Dan Davidson holds PhD in Slavic languages from Harvard University, and he's an author of, an editor of 44 books, over 60 articles in the fields of language, culture, and educational development, including a major 20-year longitudinal study of adult SLA. His research studies, study abroad, when, how long, and with what results, uh, is one of the most frequent, frequently cited studies on overseas language immersion over the past five years. Davidson's latest research article, Assessing Language Proficiency and Intercultural Development in the Overseas Immersion Context, appears in Exploring the U.S. Language Flagship Program, Professional Competence in the Second Language by Graduation, edited by uh, Diana Murphy and Karen Evans from Maine. Um, he's a member of the Commission on Languages of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a foreign member of the Russian Academy of Education, Vice President of the International Association of Teachers of Russian Language and Literature, and immediate past chair of the College Board World Languages Academic Advisory Committee, and he's certainly the president of uh, American Councils. So join me in welcoming Dan. Um, Dan, now it's your turn. Okay, we are. Evgeny, thanks so much for that uh, detailed, nice introduction. Uh, I'm sorry my mom's not alive to hear you say all of that, but uh, <laughs> she, she, she would have been proud. Uh, uh, it is a, a great pleasure to see a lot of names uh, on the sign-in list here of people I know, former students and uh, respected colleagues from all around the country. Thank you for tuning in on this, and uh, I hope that uh, we'll have a appropriate amount of time toward the end uh, for you to share your views, opinions, uh, uh, contradict or, uh, or, or improve on some of the observations that I'd like to make now. Uh, so our topic is what is a global professional preparing culturally and linguistically competent U.S. graduates for the global economy. Uh, we've all heard these words many times before and I want, if I can, to try to show their relationship in terms of what, what really is different now, why we're having this topic why we're raising these issues in the year 2016, uh, when in some sense, uh, many of us on this uh, call and perhaps sitting around this room where I am, I'm delighted to be joined by about a dozen of uh, colleagues from the American Councils as well. Um, uh, in some sense, we may argue uh, convincingly that we've been doing this all along. Uh, so the legitimate question, I guess, is what has changed, what's different now, uh, and why are we have, holding this conversation yet again about global competencies? And uh, so as we go, most of you know the mission of American Councils, but I've taken the liberty just to put it up here on a slide. I know this will be in the video and transcripts. Uh, just to remind those who are not members of ACTR, American Councils, still a chance to join if you aren't, uh, that this is, this is what we do. 
Uh, Council generally works in 80 countries in the world today, and that's our map. Uh, all the notable vacation spots are, are perhaps not here. Uh, as you look carefully at that map, but you'll see what is here are the critical regions of the world, uh, the large parts of the world um, uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere that are not English speaking. Uh, that, this gives you a quick idea of the activities of American Council in a typical year. We're often known really more by the programs we operate than by our umbrella name. Many people have heard of FLEX and YES. People have heard of RLS and ACTR, of CLS and flagship and so forth, uh, and of Nestle Y most certainly. And so uh, we, we don't object to that. Those are all excellent programs and they're all contributing uh, to the same general goal. We're honored to administer those programs. And so rather than giving you an overview of what I'm gonna say, because you'll have that anyway, uh, I have actually questions for the people here. Uh, questions I hope you'll turn over in your mind uh, as I talk uh, and, and will perhaps come away with, uh, with some sort of a response that is different than, than you might make at the beginning. Uh, so again, the first question we started with, don't we already do this global professional stuff already, particularly in view of the major post 9-11 investments by our government that created the flagships, or created the uh, CLS program, created Nestle Y, TCLP, StarTalk, uh, a remarkable kind of portfolio when you think about it of and programs that uh, have their history in the, in literally the past 15 years uh, and are have clearly made a difference and complemented in many ways the title six Fulbright Hayes title eight and some of the other major funding structures that we've enjoyed in the Russian and East European field so what's what is is it, what's different this time than in other times and uh, think about demographics Think about the global economy as we go on. What needs to change, if anything, in the way we teach, uh, in the way we approach the study and teaching of second languages and cultures? And within that change, uh, I won't raise the, the thorny question of who manages the change. I, I prefer to see teachers doing that. Uh, but there is a role of government, uh, whether it's state government, districts, institutions, professionals, and most certainly the role of professional associations, especially in the United States, where it's the professional associations that have traditionally, historically, and currently set the standards for the field in general. So I guess we're raising a question about standards as well. Oh, yes, and that incidental question in the end, who picks up, who picks up the check for all of this, uh, these ambitious things, if there are any. Uh, 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 again, for those of you who may not know, uh, uh, I wanted to remind our audience about what it is that ACTR does already. And I take note, I won't sit here and read this to you, but uh, I trust that everybody uh, on, on, on the uh, connection today recognize at least some of these activities, which have come to be a critical part of the infrastructure of the Russian field in the United States. These are I could mention conferences and symposia and uh, Montreal activities as well, but most certainly these things you see before you are uh, the products, the intellectual property of ACTR that have come to be part of the overall landscape of the study and teaching of Russian in the United States. Prototype AP Russian, by the way, officially endorsed now as Newell Russian by the College Board. It's now on the College Board website as well, uh, and uh, we're very, very proud of that. That's been a mere 10 years in the making. Uh, and I also want to mention that there is a brand new book on the major speech functions of Russian put out by Natasha Hayes, the most recent book in the category of the sort of ACTR tech series. Uh, it's the uh, uh, major uh, communicative functions of, uh, oh, here it comes now. Thank, thank you, Christine. The book looks something like that. And of course, the fellowship support, American Councils has put a great premium over the years in being able to not only design programs and monitor their quality, but generate the funding around those programs that allow that quality to be preserved and improved from year to year and to ensure that students, deserving students, whether they do or don't have the money to take part in study abroad, to the extent possible, are able to go on these programs. Uh, a couple of the programs listed here, Nestle Y and CLS, are absolutely open uh, to um, uh, any student in the United States, uh, regardless of their social economic background or the school that they study in or the zip code where they live. Uh, and uh, that has meant that we have an unprecedented 
uh, diversity in study abroad today that we could only have dreamed of, I think, uh, a few years ago. Uh, participating students in Nestle Y and CLS in particular who come from tribal colleges, from primarily, uh, predominantly Hispanic, uh, historically black institutions, community colleges, uh, people who, by the way, have never been outside the United States until this event, uh, people who uh, have actually never studied a language before until their opportunity. So uh, I wanted to point out just some of the things that, that are in place right now. Um, I'm sorry, uh, just bear with me for a second here. Um, a yellow one, thank you, get rid of that. And uh, can, if we can make that large again, it'll be good. Thanks so much. I uh, had a pop-up message, that's all, nothing, nothing. And uh, what you see here in this slide uh, is just for curiosity, that we have teachers on this, uh, on this uh, connection. Uh, uh, this is the way we talk about ECTR to departing students, the students that, that I was just describing to you, uh, because they have their own perspective. They may have used a book or taken part in Star Talk or Nestle Y or, uh, or uh, Olympiada, uh, perhaps, or one of the uh, essay contests. But when they show up here for their independent orientation prior to departure for Russia, Kazakhstan, or one of the Russian-speaking countries, this is what they kind of hear about from us, that we track student learning carefully, that we work with local speaking institutions, faculty, and homestays. And you can see there the emphasis ACTR has always put on direct connections with indigenous, normal, overseas schools, academies, and institutes. Uh, we don't create bubble programs in centers that we build overseas and then send people to our, to our basically to our own units. Uh, and that is a model, and that's a trusted model in U.S. higher education. It's not one that we particularly believe in. Uh, much prefer for our students to have the direct, uh, immediate experience of learning and studying, of living with the family, of doing internships in, in, in real overseas organizations, and studying and teaching in an institution that is in our case, Russian or Russian speaking. And all, with all that that implies in terms of the way that institution is managed, the way it's run, the way decisions are made, and so forth, there's a great deal there to be learned uh, by being in an acquisition bridge context like that. And the last thing I'm gonna draw your attention to because it becomes a major subject in our discussion today, the importance of teaching our students to self-manage. Um, this is something I'd like to say American students were good at, uh, but I've not noticed in the last 10 years, or even the last 15 years, any particular jumps in the quality of sort of self-management that our incoming students exhibit. They seem quite often to be highly de dependent on a highly specified syllabus, uh, which specifies exactly how much time, what to read, what not to read, and uh, are sometimes a little reluctant to strike out on their own and make decisions about, about their learning. So uh, we've tried to develop that skill in our overseas students for whom virtually any contact in the language from the moment they step off the plane is a potential learning experience, not just the time spent in a classroom or engaging with a peer tutor, but literally any interaction, any speech act that they do, whether it's simply trying to say thank you for something or make a request or say goodbye or turn down an invitation. Uh, these are learning experiences with, with we want the students to attend to, pay attention, to note how well they work, to figure out how to do it better next time when it, when it doesn't work. Uh, this is a familiar artifact for everyone on the, on the connection, uh, and uh, we do talk about linguistic competence. And I hope to show to you today that the linguistic competence is absolutely central to the development of the other competencies that we associate with being a global professional. That is the intercultural competencies, the team building skills, the tolerance for difference, the openness to alternative frames of reference and belief structures. Well, uh, so talking about linguistic competence, here you see typical measured outcomes of pre and post semester long study programs. I just took a recent RLAS program, 2014-15. You'll see the OPI pre and post language scores there. The light blue bars are the pre-scores. It's what the students brought to us from their home institution. Uh, and you can see generally students go over to Russia typically for the first time with uh, uh, abilities with measured proficiencies in the intermediate level. Uh, they return uh, in uh, advanced uh, 
I think there's a little bit of an echo effect here, don't we, Mark? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they return typically at the intermediate high, advanced level. You can see kind of the median uh, entering proficiency is in the lower intermediate range, the typical, okay, the typical pro uh, uh, proficiency upon completion of the semester is very near, you can see right there at the advanced threshold. This is the same dip, uh, group of students uh, after a year of study, and there you can see the uh, growth in proficiency is very marked. A year overseas on the RLAS programs clearly moved the aggregate population from a typical one intermediate level solidly into the two range. And if you look carefully at the outliers, you see a couple of hot shots there to the right that are already at level three. And those who don't make two, you see 22% of them are at one plus. Uh, if you know the proficiency system, you know the scale well, you know that a one plus is very, very close. Uh, to being a two as well. And finally, uh, for uh, those who are able to take advantage of the flagship uh, program, and I remind our Russian colleagues here that flagship is open uh, to at-large applicants from any American school, uh, and there have been uh, applicants uh, most recently from Brandeis and Carleton and Michigan and several other places that uh, are actually not in the nar narrow network of flagship uh, designated institutions. If you've got the two level proficiency, we will review you for that program. Flagship accepts at level two, where the other one leaves off, and brings students home, as you can see, solidly in the three range. In fact, overwhelmingly in the three range. Three, recall, is the definition of a professional linguist or a person qualified to occupy a language designated billet in the US government or to, uh, to uh, carry out uh, detailed professional activity uh, in a foreign language. That's a three, and that's what this program produces, and it produces it very consistently at a rate of approximately 90%, as you can see from that data. Uh, and these students who leave the flagship program also graduate from college at that moment. So at level three and with a BA in hand, uh, those students are ready to go on either to graduate school or enter the, enter the profession at that point. So if we're doing this all so good, uh, what, what, what is wrong and what, what needs to change? Uh, I wanna, wanna, want us now to step back in the next part of our talk and look at data, uh, which you may or may not have taken the trouble to look at from the most recent 2010 USA uh, 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 census. Because the census asks the perfect, like, like most national censuses, uh, asks the question, uh, what percentage of the US population speaks a foreign language? And what you see there uh, is uh, approximately 16% of all Americans, given the present population, 16% make some claim to knowing a foreign language. But of that 16%, only 8%, or only half of that group, claim to speak a language well. Uh, so that is, in a sense, the problem, the challenge that our country has in a global economy, that we have a very limited number of people who even claim uh, to speak uh, a second language well. Uh, and uh, part of that, one might say, comes largely from the fact that those people who do make the claim of speaking the language well, speak it well because they speak it at home. Uh, and here you can see the breakdown again of languages spoken at home by Americans where some language other than English is, is the norm. And this number you see here, um, uh, which is about 21% of the US population, speaks a language other than English at home, has doubled since the 1980 census, which I think the last one I bothered to look at on this subject. So we have increasing diversity here in the United States with uh, over 20% of our total US population speaking one of those languages you see over there in the, uh, the right-hand side. All of them are percentage of total American population, of course, are tiny. But if you notice, it's kind of curious that Russian, Arabic, French, Korean, German uh, are really roughly the same, either 0.3 or 0.4% of the total population. So our heritage populations are are diverse and uh, actually growing. Uh, predictions, we can look at the year 2025 or the year 2050, and you'll see this number continuing to grow. 
Or alternatively, you can look at the current population of our major urban areas like New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles. It's interesting as a teacher of foreign languages to take into, take into account that 41% of all the students matriculated in the New York public school system, K-12, 41% speak a language other than English at home. The situation, we just saw the data from California about a week ago, uh, and the number there is actually higher. It's 44% in California. So our own nation is increasingly diverse. And the point I like to draw from that is when we talk about a globalized economy, we are talking about a globalized America. An America where uh, social services, law enforcement, the judicial system, uh, to name a few, are highly dependent on a multilingual population and multilingual speakers. For anybody who's had any reason to visit a U.S. hospital in the last 10 years, uh, I invite you to just look around and look who the doctors are, who the nurses are, who the med techs, who the pathologists are, uh, who runs the, the, our, our healthcare industry. And then think to yourself, who, who will do this in the future? And what, what are the linguistic credentials that we as a country need to have? Uh, notice I particularly not stress the two obvious sectors of our economy, namely business and government, where the need for foreign language skills is overwhelmingly documented. Our U.S. government has been at least good in knowing what it wants and what it needs, particularly in the 9-11 era. So uh, again, when we talk about globalization, we're, we're not just talking here about who, who sits in an embassy in Dakar or uh, who has gone to man a staff and office uh, in Vladivostok. We're talking about ourselves as well as uh, the global economy. Now this I'm very proud to share. This is unpublished and as yet unseen by anybody except the people on this connection. This is the brand new uh, results of the uh, census of foreign language learners in the United States, uh, a project just completing right now by American councils in cooperation with ACPO, CAL, and MLA. This will be the first ever census of foreign language learning in the United States, K through 16. And what this is, is a, just a preview a trailer, if you will, of what you're gonna see a little bit later at the time of our annual meetings. Um, uh, what this is, uh, is what we learned about the states in the United States where foreign language is taught extensively. And there you can see, it's divided by quintals because this is the way it's done in, uh, in Europe, I guess. Um, the states uh, that are ranked in the top quintal are those states that have 30 to 40% of all students enrolled in K-12 programs also matriculated in a foreign language. Hope I didn't say that too fast. So uh, the, the, the best ranking states here are those that have 30 to 40% of all their K-12 students enrolled in some kind of foreign language learning. Keep in mind this is languages other than English. So states like California and New York with very large L-E, uh, English learners, I'm sorry, E-L learners, those kids are not counted in this tally. That's a, that's a separate tally in the, in the stats. So again, we're not talking about first generation learners of English, we're talking here about everybody else who learns a foreign language. I hope that's made clear. Now what strikes me in looking at this <clears throat> is that our honor roll here consists of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, state of Maryland, if you look carefully, uh, the, the, the northern New England states, um, some states and with, with very small populations for that matter, including Utah, which shouldn't surprise too many people, uh, where uh, a good record for teaching foreign language uh, is, is considered to be 30%. A third learn a foreign language, one. Now, if you compare this just for a moment with the data that was released earlier this week by Eurostat, uh, same scale uh, in primary education alone in the 38 European states, 84% of all students learn a foreign language in primary education. And then in secondary education, they learn a second foreign language. Um, so we're, we're not exactly comparing ourselves to Europe at this point, but uh, one, one can see that there's a lot of room for progress here in terms of who learns languages in the United States. 
And now I promised something from the business sector and wanted to show you this right now. This is a brand new set of listings picked up by my colleagues at the Commission of, uh, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, that looks at the, just compares 2010 with 2015. They, they're based in Massachusetts, so they looked at the Massachusetts data, but they're very similar data from other states in which you can see the jump in job postings in which bilingual candidates are stipulated. Uh, now that's, that's pretty impressive as a jump for a single state, but you can see the number has gone from what 40 or 5,400 or something in 2010 to well over 14,000 in 2015. Um, another study not shown here, but one you may follow, is the annual Michigan State Survey of, um, of uh, HR directors. They interview 2,100 HR directors, not CEOs, but HR directors. Um, and uh, there, 93% of the businesses listing uh, appointments or, or, or openings uh, said they needed uh, people with experience and skill in operating in international teams. Let me repeat that, 93% of the HR directors in the Michigan State 2015 survey show um, a need for people ready to operate in international teams. So this finally takes us to the topic and the definition of today's uh, discussion, is what exactly then do we mean now by a global professional. It used to be somebody, I guess, who could work overseas and wouldn't come home after a week. Uh, now we seem to have a, uh, a much more demanding definition. The government stepped in and said it must be level three, preferably a little bit higher, uh, and it ideally is accompanied by a master's degree. Uh, but let's look at what our own U.S. Department of Education is uh, releasing. Again, I apologize, you have not seen this yet. It's not published yet but the Department of Education has just released for discussion a new definition of a globally competent individual, and I draw your attention to the first bullet point there because that was notably missing the last time they did this. Uh, they've understood proficient in at least two languages. I remind you, this is the U.S. Department of Education saying this, and they're talking about K-12 and, and, uh, and higher ed in the United States. And look at some of the other skills that are incorporated, and this begins to challenge those of us on this, on this call. Advanced social, emotional, and leadership skills. Ability to effectively collaborate, communicate with people in cross-cultural settings. That echoes exactly what the Michigan State HR Director's uh, 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 solicitation noted. Demonstrated ability to engage in a wide range of civic and global issues and to be successful in one's own discipline in a global context. Sensitive to differences that exist between cultures. Open to diverse perspectives. Appreciative of insight gained through open cultural exchange. And then you see a few more examples below. I love the, the one that's highlighted there, which I will read everything for you. Uh, able to operate at a professional level in intercultural and international context and to continue to develop new skills and harness technology to support continued growth. Note that last element coming from the Department of Education, continued emphasis on self-management, on self-learning, on lifelong learning. Uh, you're not ever done with this. It's a lifelong uh, undertaking. I'm very proud of our Department of Education, and to tell you, I had really uh, very little to do with any of this. I'm just pleased that they uh, have come around to a position that say people who work in the State Department or the Defense Department or the Commerce Department or the Peace Corps have understood uh, for, for many, many years, but now uh, the Obama administration has also embraced this important um, definition. Now, for comparison's sake, and, and again, before I step away from this, this will be part of a curriculum continuum. Uh, for those of you who teach K-12 or work with K-12 teachers and training them, there is a long continuum that begins with really pre-K and takes each of the strands you see here which represent the culmination and effectively shows the stage. What, does the, what do these same set of skills look like at, say, early primary? What does the middle school version of this look like? What does the senior secondary version of this look like in terms of language and social emotional and leadership and intercultural skill building? What does the higher ed version of this look like? And finally, what does the professional 
kind of outcome? What is this culturally and globally competent professional actually able to do when they've been through this whole continuum? I'm thrilled to see this coming out of the Department of Education, perhaps eight years or even 16 years late, but now it's there. And, uh, and I think for all of us on this call, uh, this, is, this is a significant development. And to put it in context, I want to show you a couple of other things. The OECD, representing the 80 most highly developed economic nations in the world, uh, has added, will be adding a question on, on global competence to the next piece of test, a test that's administered to 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds in 80 countries of the world. Notice their definition of what global competence in is. It's not at all unlike what the Department of Education has said. And again, OECD uh, represents uh, the, basically the developed economies of the, of the modern world. But notice how it's it states here, to understand how differences affect perceptions, judgments, and ideas of self and others, and to engage in open, appropriate, and effective interactions with others from different backgrounds on the basis of shared respect for human dignity. Capacity to analyze global and intercultural issues critically and from multiple perspectives. Uh, the understanding here that the language you use and the use of language affects the judgments that we all make on a day-to-day -day basis. The idea that language is just somehow this communication channel uh, misses about 80% of the ways that languages are used in the world today. Uh, we in the United States have always emphasized, and we're actually on this call or doing it again, about how language and employability are tightly linked. But notice how our colleagues in Europe go about this in a little different way. I want you to see the common European framework, which stresses language and cultural skills as part of a larger need for social integration. It's about building relationships, resolving conflicts between cultural groups, communicating effectively. Uh, as I say to departing students on our flagship and other programs here, um, intercultural knowledge is just not about knowing how to strike up and sign an agreement uh, with a business person around the world. Uh, you basically can do that over a drink and in the back of an envelope if you need to. Uh, the intercultural skills come into play the moment one uh, experiences conflict. It's not signing the agreement. It's when we start fulfilling the agreement and discover that we have rather different understandings of what we just agreed to do and how we then mediate those differences. Uh, you promised to sell me widgets, but then I got your widgets and they don't look like what the, what the picture you showed me, or they don't quite do what I need. So uh, what do we do? Uh, sever the relationship at that point? Uh, maybe it was somehow we didn't understand. How do you find the middle ground? How do you maintain that relationship of trust that enables people to not just sign agreements, but actually keep those agreements, maintain them, and, and develop them into, into long-lasting, durable uh, 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 partnerships, if, if that's indeed the goal. Um, there's the Michigan State Survey. I quoted that already. I won't do it again. And here's Microsoft's definition of global professional. Uh, this has been out and was uh, presented to the U.S. Congress about five years ago by the senior director of Microsoft for higher education relations. And there's really good stuff here. Notice um, you have to look carefully. They don't actually mention uh, computer programming. Your science. What they mentioned is uh, uh, our, our different set of competencies. Number five, intentional learners we've seen before, and that idea of perspective of seeing the big picture, to understand not just the details but the underlying forces affecting an overseas system, and notice the emphasis on creativity, perspective, seeing things in a different way, thinking outside the box. Now here's one I bet you haven't seen, or maybe you do if you read the Harvard Business School carefully, uh, a, a survey of what makes an innovative business leader. What are the common traits? Harvard undertook this, partly because Harvard has the money to do such things as this, uh, to reach out to 1,300 business leaders all around the, country, all the world to say, what is it these very successful innovators have? And what they found quickly was that there was nothing they had in common. They were all different except for what you see here with something that Harvard, with some stress and strain, decided to call contextual intelligence. And people, the linguists on this phone call will probably grin when they see that, contextual intelligence. Uh, the widespread ability to identify trends, shared ability to recognize context, shift context, and synthesize across context. This has sounded all familiar to any teacher on this call. Contextual acuity is understanding 
self-referential ability, recognize one's own personal, cultural, and organizational context, to understand that the glasses, the lenses I look through are also coloring what I see and what I don't see, what I notice and what I never notice. And this might be summarized under the somewhat suspicious term of cultural intelligence with all due respect to Howard Gardner. Self-reflexivity, ability to shift perspective from one's own to others. But what they were really saying is that the successful executive has a remarkable ability to move from one business context to another business context and suddenly shift gears, to see it the way the locals see it, to see the way the culture of a particular business is different from the culture perhaps of the one he just or she just came from. Bilinguals, by the way, have an unusually good record in this area. And uh, what Harvard is getting at, if you read the, there's a reference to the bottom if you're interested in cultural intelligence, uh, is actually the reasons for the very high rate of transnational US business failure. Harvard often does that. They look at product failure. In this case, the topic was transnational business failure to better understand why that keeps happening. And guess, again, the reason seemed to be well, and strongly that the, the failure to take into account local context. Americans put a great deal of faith in technology and not nearly enough attention to context, particularly con local cultural context, and this is where it leads us. In terms of faculty and teachers, I think what I took away from this reading and this experience of the last several years has been that our job is bigger than we thought. Uh, I'm very comfortable talking about knowledge transfer. Uh, uh, it's fun to teach grammar and communication. Uh, uh, I, I happen to like social linguistics, uh, but um, if we do not see that the task in training somebody to be a global professional goes beyond just knowledge transfer, but to skill building, which we in language always have understood, to also the development of attitudes that include the ones you see there, respect, openness, curiosity, willingness to move beyond one's comfort zone, readiness to demonstrate that others are valued less ethnocentrically and so forth. That's what the Department of Education is partly getting at when they talk about the socio-emotional maturity to deal with oneself in a complex uh, uh, culture that is different than one's own. Uh, and I think, um, hesitate to go into too much detail, but our colleague Betty Lieber uh, has put it in a different way at DLI. She calls her approach transformative, transformational pedagogy, uh, which she calls a post-pedagogical or post-methods approach. Uh, but when she and I sat down to compare notes, I think what she calls transformational pedagogy is not at all like, not unlike what we're trying to do in our overseas pedagogical approaches by trying to set up both contexts and frankly interventions that will help move our students not only along the knowledge continuum, but also to develop the attitudes and skill sets uh, that they may not have developed uh, in their prior education. Uh, this, you may think, is an unending list of, uh, of uh, competency definitions, but I wanted you to see the most recent one for intercultural community of competence developed by the U.S. Department of State. This ICC set of standards uh, is um, uh, now in use at the State Department in the testing and analysis of candidates for the Foreign Service and for other highly sensitive overseas positions where it's not just the linguistic knowledge, but it's the cultural sophistication that's required to perform the tasks here that you can see. A level three, for example, rarely misreads cultural cues and can almost always repair misinterpretations when they occur, you see, and understanding different uses of genre, modes, points of view, and so forth. Uh, I think this is a strong, this is, this, these statements were developed by senior scholars in the field. This is not something a bunch of State Department bureaucrats sat down and developed. These are done by our colleagues in the field in, in, different, in different languages. Now, from a student's point of view, um, and if you're an overseas student, which is what we're talking about today, uh, and if you take all this seriously, 
these high stakes interactions, low stakes interactions, reflecting on your every utterance, every speech act. What you walk away with, I would suggest, is a really good case of cognitive overload and, and, uh, and, and, and perhaps a mild sense of depression. Um, that, that everything that around you uh, is in fact more complicated than it appears. And the foreign speaker quickly understands that while you used to think you understood everything, now you're there and you realize at level two plus and three that you actually don't understand nearly as well as you thought you did. And uh, that is not an ego booster to be sure, but it is a, certainly a challenge that requires reflection. And here I think we come to one of those changes that have occurred in our pedagogy, that if the proficiency movement and the community competence movement uh, put such a premium on, um, on, on activity, on, on delivering language. I remember being yelled out in the 1980s in one of those seminars, it's not what they know about the language, it's what they can do with the language. And, uh, and of course, in some ways that is true, but uh, what we're seeing is in today's very complex world uh, and operating at the levels that we're talking about on this call, uh, reflection, in fact, is absolutely required. The students need to stand back and assess situations, assess what just happened. I heard something, I said something, uh, I just got something I believe is feedback, I'm still trying to understand what just happened. Uh, and that takes a reflection and some kind of mechanisms for uh, recording those reflections, for fixing them in one's memory, and then returning to them and developing strategies to do better next time. Uh, all made more, com more complex by the fact that the old kind of reliable concept of the educated native speaker, remember the ENS, that if anybody's ever trained in proficiency remembers, that that educated native speaker, for me as a young student of German, it was that man or woman from Hanover, the middle part of Germany, the only part of Germany where they sort of spoke it right, uh, everything else was dialectal, or it was a Parisian accent, and God help us if you had provincialisms in your speech. Uh, now the opposite is true. The, the, those sort of model native speakers are, are actually nowhere to be found and uh, that everybody mixes and blends and meshes and code switches uh, to an extraordinary degree, um, particularly in the, in the critical regions of the world that we're talking about here. Uh, so uh, that normative language still has to be taught in some way, but our students have to be able to process more than just this highly normative language that is spoken on um, in the theater or, or by certain teachers. Um, students are dealing on at least three levels, and here I borrow uh, with, uh, uh, delighted to acknowledge that a debt to uh, Heidi Burns and her team uh, in, uh, uh, reflected in this most recent issue of Modern Language Journal, uh, in which she sort of tried to look at the real world at level, level two and three, uh, the transactional level, which is just generating speech, uh, the networking level, which is really what motivates all our students uh, to engage overseas. That's what makes the overseas experience so overwhelmingly powerful uh, from the socio-emotional, linguistic, cultural, knowledge-based, academic, intellectual way through these networks that our students engage in. And they're all different and they all reflect interests and they may range from places of worship, to social organizations, to clubs, uh, to networking, to digital networks, schools, neighborhoods, families, and so forth. That's what makes people want to use the language. And then they operate, as we can see, in what might be called, what Heidi calls the um, macro level and our ideological level, the, uh, the level where all these transactions and all these motivations are judged by a system of values and belief structures that are very different than the one we have grown up in. And the whole issue of whether something is effective and whether something is appropriate is judged not by the speaker, but by the people who surround them. And those judgments will reflect, again, not, not my view of the universe, but in this case, their view of the universe. Uh, whether it was boastful, whether it was polite, whether it was arrogant, uh, whether it was even appropriate, is determined by the host country culture. Uh, and uh, so that sort of ability to understand the lens uh, that the host country provides is absolutely critical for our students to be successful in, in that culture. Um, I won't read all of this to you, but this is one example of a case study on lenses. 
Uh, it's a remarkable study written by one of our alums in one of our language utilization reports. And you can see the preconceived notion, of what it means. Let me just be quiet for a moment, give you a second to read that. We can agree at the outset that it's a, it's a smart report. Uh, it's a thoughtful student, and if you didn't know better, you'd swear she might be an anthropologist or an ethnographer, and she uh, actually uh, is not. But what I love about it, the reason we show this sometimes to advanced students, is it shows a way in which our preconceived notions about what's just right uh, and what's not right out there uh, need always to be adjusted to the local context in order to even make sense of them. Uh, our students go not to change cultures, not to quote unquote fix things overseas, but to uh, uh, in fact understand them and appreciate in a sense how they work, what is it, what's the dynamic. Um, and uh, the, our best students do this exceedingly well, as I think this shows you an example. We discussed this here as part of an outbound uh, intervention strategy and then or as part of an overseas uh, cultural adaptation roundtable uh, and talk about the alternatives that the young woman had. One of which is she could have declined to sit with the women but rather taken a seat with the men because as a foreigner and a guest in the house, they would have permitted her to do that. Uh, so she could have played, shall we say, the honored foreigner card as they say in Chinese uh, but she wasn't willing to do that. She wanted to know well, how things really work here. And so as you say, uh, out of some sort of respect for my relatives, I, I went to sit with the women. Uh, and we talk about, notice she now regards her own culture and her own position a little bit differently and uh, understood. Anyway, this is just an example of, of the application of a kind of an intervention uh, about thinking more deeply about the cultural context that, that we work in. Our language utilization reports give students a chance to reflect. Uh, they're actually required in the flagship to do it. It's not optional. And they write a, a weekly language utilization report that among other things, well, consists of two parts, a time place map uh, for just thinking about how you used your language this week and what context and how much. And then several open-ended questions that we discussed already about what worked well, think about a, a speech situation which you you did pretty well, maybe you surprised yourself, and think about also cultural differences, uh, and uh, they record those for us. We keep quantitative results, as uh, many are aware, uh, with the way our students spend their time. Uh, level three students that you're looking at right here spend on average between 60 and 80 hours a week using the target language. That used to be in the form of reading, or it could be watching television, or it could be hanging out with friends, or it might be attending cultural events, uh, and so forth. And you can see then within that, they mobilize their time in different ways. And we've seen some clear correlations about how that time is used and so forth. Um, overall, uh, uh, despite all the complaints that people are overworked in this course in law school, what you see is that in fact, uh, life is not too bad. About 40% is spent on academic, 15% with friends, 15 and so forth. You can see it's a, not a bad life for a year uh, and probably not another year in any of our students' lives when they're gonna have this much time to just learn and focus on their own development. Uh, I wanna show you some of the examples here before we shut down. Uh, students do use these to think and any, any experienced teacher on this call will uh, look at this. Um, and the, the first one is very, very typical of an early, early stage, uh, sort of two plus level learner, you see taking a direct enrollment course uh, at this case of St. Petersburg State University, and uh, uh, you know, doing fine understanding the lecture, uh, but having a devil, devil of a time understanding what Russian students say. Why do they mumble so much uh, is, is the complaint. And there you see the student kind of saying, I've got to get more practice with conversation with formal Russian. Clearly the student has good training, uh, and he was embarrassed to keep saying, well, would you say that again, please? Uh, and he 
realized that probably his training had focused largely on quite formal Russian, probably newspapers and, uh, and uh, television uh, uh, talk and not enough chance to hear colloquial Russian. Uh, here's another typical concern that our students have and they'll reflect on early in their experience about how, how constrained they are at expressing emotion in Russian. They know a half dozen words and then those get pretty dull after a while. What do you say when there's this amazing, beautiful scene and a well-prepared mail? How do I express gratitude and delight? And then the student notes, I'm in an acquisition-rich environment here. I'll just pay attention to what my Russian family says to one another when they're upset about something or when they're really wild by something, and uh, I'll, I can imitate that. Uh, Claire Crouch puts it this way, in order to develop their own voice, the foreign language learner must first develop an ear for other voices. And essentially, that's what you hear those students doing right there. They're developing an ear not just for voices, but also for how people think, how they view the world, what's possible to say, um, when do you have... Uh, when, when do you have agency and when do you not? Uh, when is it okay to say I and so forth? And those of you who know something about the former studies that we've done around here and analysis of word associations in English and Russian uh, have probably seen this material before. Uh, but there's an example of talking about success and what that means uh, to a Russian and what that meant to a generation of Americans uh, with the one attached to much more the Russian uh, definition being much more value-laden and the American being uh, rather more economic. Uh, uh, let me go back to that for a second and notice, by the way, if you go the fifth item down, luck and goals, you'll see that for the uh, Russian, success had much more to do with fortune. You know, the Russian emphasis on chilevik vizuchi, ni vizuchi. Uh, or fate or determinism, however one wants to think of this, than it was for the Americans. Americans don't rule out luck. A little luck doesn't hurt, but the Americans associate success with personal achievement, uh, individual achievement and individuality to a greater degree than their colleagues in Russia do. And that affects many, many things about the way we talk about the locus of control and situations. They're very, very basic to many, many human interactions. Here's another example. It's kind of a, a fun one of looking at the concept, again, of help. It's a very telling one from the point of view of who helps, when do you help, how soon do you help, and who delivers the help. Uh, this is very, very basic to anyone who has ever worked with a, a Russian partner or ever taught Russian students or ever had a Russian exchange student in your school, uh, that the issue of calling for help and so forth is very, very differently divided in our, in our two cultures, and there you can see some ways on how to understand that. Um, so we uh, kind of tie up our, our comments today by remembering that the social dynamics of Russian, uh, that the use of, of, uh, of the way we construct uh, uh, functionalities in Russian begins first and foremost with the words we choose, and every word has a cultural a context. It has a cultural aura around it, as, as Bakhtin said, uh, and, uh, or as, as uh, Speed said, uh, you, these words are not yours. These words belong to somebody else, and they don't become your words until you've populated them yourself and you've used them and you've understood the scent that they carry of other people's voices. I kind of love that, partly because Speed had the incredible intelligence to say that in the year 1927, about 75 years before anybody else was talking about these things. Um, so anyway, yeah, choice of words comes down to culture, to the, the belief system and value structures that are embedded in each and every word, followed then by the way that we construct, uh, the way we engage and, and, and use uh, language uh, to convey those meanings. Um, and you can see social, cultural context, social, so pragmatic strategy selections have a lot to do with this. There's examples of those social, pragmatic strategy selections that really should not be learned only when you get to Russia. Uh, to me, one needs to get these, uh, uh, sort of learn the right way to make a request in Russian early on. Uh, and uh, i give you a simple example that uh, uh, Americans, no matter what we've taught them here, uh, are much more likely to say, мне нужно, я хочу, я хотел бы, помогите, пожалуйста, whereas, Take it back, Russian Americans will never say Bamagizi Bashalska. We don't ask for help as a culture. Uh, but uh, uh, we will say Yahachu, uh, uh, 
whereas uh, a Russian is much more likely to say "avam uh, yitrutna," uh, the, the sort of shifting of, of the source uh, the, of the agency away from the uh, uh, to the other. Uh, more so, by the way, it's more about "vam" and "other" than it is in Russian about about um, collective. I don't see quite so much about "num." Uh, apologies, locus of control. Uh, Americans say, I'm sorry, this is all my fault. Uh, a Russian would never say that. They'll say, oh, he's nice, what uh, And uh, right, we've immediately shifted the whole locus of control out away. And again, what, what, why I'm going over these examples as we wind up here is that this is in fact that macro level that we were talking about. This is the ideology, the over, overarching kind of system of beliefs and, and, and view of the world that informs not just high-level discussion, but informs the actual shape of every Russian utterance. These are very basic things, requests, expressions of gratitude, apologies, persuasion, admonitions, disagreement. All of this comes down to a view of the world. Russians can say when our American students speak, I understand what you said, but what you just said is not how any Russian would have said that. Uh, hard to get this any place but overseas, but once you're overseas, you also have to know what you're looking for. You have to know what to listen for. And that's where I think, that's where the intercultural pragmatic competence is coming in here. Um, embedded cultural references, this is a charming piece right here about Kimo and the fact that Russians embed quotations to an extraordinary degree in their speech, never ever referencing the sources. And I like that last sentence. This makes me wonder what I thought they meant before. <laughs> Where, where, where this went out, now I realize where these, all these many quotes. Uh, one of my graduation, graduate students at Bryn Mawr analyzed that uh, uh, Russian headlines out of nearly 10,000 pages of press and discovered that something approaching 40% of all those headlines involved non-referenced embedded quotations, many of them inverted and many of them distorted on purpose, never referenced, because Russians get them, right? They read it already, so that sort of embedded uh, referencing is there. Um, and there's the everlasting battle of language. And so I will not keep you long in this, but uh, I think right now we should stop and turn the floor back to Yevgeny, because uh, I've talked much too long, uh, but I hope you found that interesting. Let me stop there. Thank you, Dan. Um, we didn't have a lot of questions uh, when you were speaking, uh, but uh, I will welcome everyone to type your questions <laughs> Um, now, uh, using the Q&A uh, button. A question from Tom Garza, who asked you, with the imperative of the in-country experience to attain global professional status, are there any suggestions or recommendations for making the rather costly prospect of even a summer experience in Russia available to students who truly do not have the financial resources to go? Even the short-term summer experience is cost prohibitive as this student uh, also lose their earning ability during the summer months. How can institutions leverage financial aid for the large number of low-income students at many of our institutions? May I respond to that now, Yevgeny? Yes, please. Uh, I, I think, in, in, in effect, Tom has gone to that bottom line right away, which uh, it, it, this, this may be good, but who's going to pay for it? And uh, Tom himself has done a great deal at Texas to make his programs accessible to students who otherwise would not be able to, to, to take part. Uh, I've referenced what I think is the right general direction for this, and that is that uh, the, the mandate for globalization ultimately is a federal mandate, and it is perhaps right now best understood uh, by the federal government. The comments that I made today inside the Washington DC belt, Beltway are not particularly astonishing. They're, they're sort of understood, maybe formulated not in quite this way, but people in government understand that language is imperative and that language is not just knowing a code, it's understanding behavior and it's about, it's about developing relationships. Businessmen understood that and understand this very well. So uh, to come to Tommy's good point, uh, I think uh, we can continue to make the case to the federal government that the U.S. capacity to compete in a global economy, in a global uh, uh, context right now, is going increasingly to depend 
on whether we do or don't have people who have the global competencies to carry out that work. Uh, the alternative to that is uh, that you, the U.S. will continue to lose ground in the very competitive global economy and we, we will slip backwards as a country. Let me give you a couple of examples of that uh, because right now um, uh, the, the Brits, uh, the English, uh, who also suffer from this Anglophone curse that we have, uh, have said very well that, um, that if English was in fact an advantage for Americans and Brits and Canadians back in the 80s and 90s, when, when internationalization was still in its infant stage and the internet was still in its infant stage and it was sort of basically English and all that, uh, that uh, those who knew English kind of had a leg up in international business transactions. Uh, now, uh, with 800 million Chinese already speaking Chinese, it's speaking English, and uh, a, a large proportion of the middle class of, of, uh, of, the, of the world either learning or already speaking English very well, it's the person who doesn't speak a second language, who now has, who doesn't speak a second language and only has English, that is going to be in need of accommodation. Let me put it another way. Uh, if you walk into a business setting and everybody in that room and around that table is multilingual except you, then you're the one that will be accommodated in that setting. Uh, you'll, have, you'll be disadvantaged as a negotiator. You'll be disadvantaged because you won't pick up a lot of the quiet signals. And anytime uh, they want to talk about something that uh, is significant, uh, they ship into their own language and, and you're out of the game. Uh, language is critical not just for trans for transferring information as we talked about. It's critical for for building rapport, for developing trust. Uh, it's how it's how people learn to trust one another. Is to understand that you and I somehow see the world the same way. We're on the same page. Oh, I see. We're reading the same book, right? Those are the ways that we kind of develop a, com a sense of commonality and common value with somebody, and that comes down to language. Uh, try doing that without language. See how you do. Um, so, uh, to Tom, to come back to your good question, I think we can argue and will argue that second, that, that U.S. Department of Education mandate that you just saw there, right? That's why I'm trying to start it with that today. If the U.S. Department of Education says that we need globally competent citizens and the uh, uh, employment industry is saying we need 93% of the, of, the, of the positions we're hiring right now need to be able to operate with international teams, then you're getting a pretty strong mandate, not only from the U.S. government, the Department of Education, and U.S. business, but also from the social sector uh, that, uh, that we've got to have language capacity. Now, the other slide I showed you was that dismal number of Americans who claim any proficiency at all in English, counting heritage, anybody, you can see we're, we're sitting with about 30 million people, average age of whom, by the way, is 55. Um, that's not an answer. Uh, to, to where we're going. So we've got to develop this capacity going forward in our educational system, not after people leave the educational system, but while they're in it. And uh, that means that the government has got a role to play, particularly in the financing and study abroad. Uh, business has a role to play. But the big deal here is the states have got to wake up to this. You can see from the map I showed you of the 50 states, and some were dark and some were not so dark, you can see a few of the states are waking up to this. And so probably that same competitive energy that makes Wisconsin and Maryland and, and Washington, Utah, and some of these other states, you know, uh, start investing in language and in their language education system uh, is going to probably create some uh, very useful competition among and across states as well, as well as across school districts. So uh, this is, I don't, don't know how else to answer Tom's good question to say that all the interested sectors uh, have to a number one become aware of this and i think that the american academy commission reports one of which will appear in a couple of months i think and then another one around february just in time for the for a new administration here in the city uh we hope that that, that commission is going to really rub people's face in the stuff we're talking about here it's one thing for us language professionals to go on and on about this it's quite another thing when the american academy and 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 the people that it brings to the table uh, make the same statement. So I hope we can raise awareness uh, so that all of us can make the, the case wherever we are.
Thank you, Dan. We have um, uh, a couple of questions from uh, K-12 teachers. Um, some anonymous participant uh, said that Tom is concerned about making immersion programs available for students. What about teachers, in particular K-12 teachers? Isn't there a need to develop those intercultural skills along with linguistic development for instructors? Not to mention the pedagogy to begin to instill those skills in students to help them progress when they are in country. Again, where might there be supports for expanding opportunities for teachers and for developing a, and that's uh, the end of the message. And actually that's J Jane Shuffleton who asked this question. Wonderful comment. And uh, what I think before we were kind of talking about the uh, US population as a whole, uh, and uh, it's, it's very clear as Tom points out, uh, we, we're never going to be able to train everybody overseas. But right now, we're training so few people overseas that we're not going to begin to meet our current needs with those people. Now, if you're one of those who did train overseas, you're in a pretty good position because there are a lot of people in the next five to 10 years who are going to be coming after you. But uh, uh, there, there are other ways to gain, for the population at large, there are other ways to gain familiarity with languages and cultures, and one is through outreach to our heritage communities. Another, if you're in an educational uh, system like, like the US, uh, is to take advantage and, in fact, be more uh, aggressive in hosting of foreign nationals. Because let's say, if not everybody can go overseas, but if your school or your classroom can invite a student from an important part of the world or a world you're studying uh, to come and live in your school or study there for a year or live in the dormitory or stay with you as a, as a homestay uh, fellow, then you're going to learn a lot nonetheless by hosting. If you can't go yourself, or maybe you do both, but if you're hosting uh, uh, visitors from overseas, if you're taking advantage of internet broadcasts and things, I think, I think there are ways that we can internationalize our domestic education system uh, without sending everybody overseas, which takes us then to Jane Shuffleton's excellent question. Uh, teachers are a different thing, in my view. Uh, I don't see uh, any alternative to uh, providing teachers with regular opportunities for professional development in the overseas, uh, in, in the language and culture that they teach. And uh, because what we know from past research on that subject is that there is no form of academic exchange with a larger multiplier effect than the exchange of teachers. And, uh, and, and it's just sort of the gift that keeps on giving, if you think about it, a teacher's experience is so transformed by a period of overseas immersion that they come back and they honestly cannot walk into the classroom and do the same old stuff again. I know that myself from having studied overseas. I, I literally couldn't say what I was saying before because I realized I wasn't, wasn't really right. And so it, it, it changes us and a good teacher will need, particularly in the present globalization era, is gonna need to do this on a regular basis. As they say, even in the Soviet Union, it was understood that a teacher needed professional development every five years. Somebody said, even Joseph Stalin understood that. And uh, somehow, somehow we ought to at least get a, a catch up with him on the, on the need for understanding what teacher development is. So if, uh, if, uh, if we've got to be able to provide not just one time, but regular systematic immersion for our language teachers, if they're going to possibly keep up with the current pace of globalization in these countries. I mean, people born in Russia who came here 15 years ago go back and tell me, including my own students, that uh, it's almost unrecognizable. Things are so different in some ways uh, that uh, you, you want to know about that. We talked about social media, and uh, social media in Russia is where our students live. Uh, if you haven't checked that out recently, I encourage you perhaps to do it. It's an incredibly complex and interesting world um, that is not very well reflected in in my first year textbook let me say <laughs> okay so jane i don't know if i if i answered your question or not but now oh yeah no there was very one more important thing that jane raised cu cu curriculum um we what you see from the department of education in that little excerpt i showed you is essentially the very beginning of a high level curricular framework for developing uh, a, a cultural and, and uh, globally competent citizens and professionals. And so that framework, look, that's a start. 
Now, we're a long ways away from a course sequence, but we may be uh, able within the next year to look at what the, what the continuum looks like in more detail, what some of the kind of obvious tools, the curricular tools might look like, perhaps then to test them and intervene. I can show you that, or pardon me, I can say that we're using interventions right now with our own students in the flagship program to try to make them much more aware of the cultural barriers that are arise, to recognize them when they arise, and to come up with ways of, of dealing constructively with them rather than simply dismissing them as weird or as unacceptable or as, as uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, not good. Um, so we're, we're sort of every level of the educational system has a challenge here, Jane, um, and it would sure, I would like to think, it would make the work of American councils a lot easier uh, on the flagship program and the RLAS programs if all this training were happening where it really should be happening, which is in, in K-12 and uh, in higher ed. Uh, thank you. Uh, then another question from Mary Nicholas, who asked, uh, we have many students who want to be global professionals, but maybe starting language study at or near the beginning. Level three proficiency may be aspirational, but only in the long, long run. How can we best address the learning needs of those students? Can they become the better global professionals even as they strive to move from novice level language? And she also adds that um, students report that the lower level of recruiters at job fairs do not seem to care about their language skills, yet the leaders of the industries say they want them. Is there any way for us to help bridge that gap? Uh, there are, uh, th thanks for Mary Nichols, uh, questions are both really, really good. And, uh, and there, there, are, there are two quite separate questions. So let me take them in the order that Mary asked them. Number one, about this the challenge of time on task. Because what Mary raises here about Russian is equally true for all the other critical languages. Uh, at the present moment, we're not seeing a lot of students entering college in, say, Arabic with substantial K-12 background, or Persian, or Turkish, uh, or Hindi, or Urdu, Urdu um, and, uh, or, or even Chinese. Now, the, the Chinese situation is now beginning to shift, and the uh, intake of entering freshmen with substantial, let's say with AP testing in uh, Chinese is, is notable. We see enough of them now starting to appear in Portuguese and in Arabic and in Russian that the Russian prototype AP, now the Newell AP, is, um, uh, is, is necessary, has quite a number of subscribers. Um, so uh, again, Mary Nichols' point is those kids that are lucky enough to come from either a dual language immersion program or from a, a high school in a district where there is substantial uh, uh, instruction in a, in a critical language, those kids really have it good uh, because uh, they, they kind of, they enter college with a good amount of, of language. Let me give you another example of where those students may be coming from today. Those who have taken the Star Talk uh, seminars have an extra leg up that can be a major stimulus to start or continue a language. It gives them that intensive boost in the summer where they can come back in the fall and be much better than they were when they left. And uh, I do want to put in a, a, a plug here for the Nestle Y program because it's fully funded. It accepts five, looking at David, 575 students a year. That's not a small number. 575 for studying critical languages, about 75 or 100 of those are for Russian. Um, and um, that is fully funded, and it, uh, those do not necessarily require a substantial prior study of the language. Uh, I have had three Nestle Y students come to Bryn Mawr uh, in the last three years uh, uh, with two level proficiency as entering freshmen. Uh, we, that's measured proficiency in speaking, reading, listening, and writing. And those students I was able to take directly into our Russian uh, 380 course, uh, which is focused on the social dynamics of Russian, uh, taught entirely in the language at a very high level. Now that's thrilling for all of us to see freshmen entering college uh, with uh, two level proficiency. Um, now that's, that's great. So that's one thing not, not to ignore, uh, but to come back to Mary's point, what about all the others who don't and have to start only as freshmen, and I think what Mary Nichols characterizes there is still the norm 
most of our languages, uh, including Russian, that most of our students began that study not in high school or junior high, uh, but, but in college. And so what we see now for 10 consecutive years is that those students, by doing an intensive summer, uh, here a domestic summer, uh, at, at places like Bryn Mawr or Middlebury or Indiana, one of those, one of those strong summer programs, Wisconsin is another one, um, UCLA has one, uh, that is take a summer and, and accelerate from first year, intensive first year, get a, a solid intensive second year, and then in your sophomore year, uh, take a sequence of advanced courses as advanced as you can get so that you can go off to Russia for the first time in the summer or for a combination of a summer plus a semester following, following that sophomore year. What this means, Mary, is that uh, the students returning from that summer plus semester after their sophomore year are in fact already, from the, you saw from the charts I showed earlier, are already pretty much in that two range. And they would then be ready, in fact, they have the, the power at that point to apply for the flagship program uh, as juniors or probably as seniors or as post-BA students. So they've got three options yet to go overseas uh, and hopefully get funded on that as well. Uh, uh, Councils does have ability to supplement and, and support students. We were pleased to receive the uh, $240,000 Fulbright Hayes Award just a couple of weeks ago, right, Graham? Uh, Graham is here from the RLS program, and so uh, Councils is eager to award that money to qualified students and encourage them to, to do, go to Russian ideally. Don't do the short one, do the longer one if you, if you can. Uh, so uh, in other words, if you look at that track that I just laid out, uh, Mary, that actually gets you there, even if you're not majoring in the language. Uh, if you can just keep taking language along with whatever else your field is, then you could actually spend a summer semester and uh, if you wish, a capstone year, but you come out of college that way at least with a two and possibly with a three uh, by the time you have your BA. Uh, now there was a second question Mary asked, which was, now slipped my mind. Do you have any help? I yes, she was um, asking about the uh, companies uh, who uh, at a high level say they want language skills, but the lower level recruiters say they don't. Yeah, and the, I think one of the, I, the, the, the most recent Michigan State study got at that by interviewing the, uh, the human resource directors, not these, these recruiters that go out to campus uh, 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 career planning offices, but uh, the, the, the HR directors are pretty clear uh, that they must have people with international experience. What those recruiters say is that we're only going to ask for a foreign language if we have jobs right here that specifically require foreign language now to hire. And if you think, well, a lot of entry-level jobs may or may not require foreign language at the outset, they tend to need the foreign language at different parts in the corporate. I mean, if you look, there's probably hardly a person in American councils where we have 175 people working, hardly a person here that doesn't know at least two languages, some know three. We have 40 different languages in this office. But if I look at the job announcements that we post, actually, some require language and some don't. Uh, and I don't, I, I can certainly say that those that come to us with the language have, uh, have an enormous advantage, even if they're coming here to work as an entry level accountant, uh, they frankly are not going to be very successful here if they don't have language. So uh, this, is a, uh, this is a real problem of communication within the industry and of CEOs and HR directors and recruiters kind of all getting onto the same page about the value of this credential. This is one of the things uh, that, uh, that the American Academy uh, Commission is going to directly address in its recommendations. It's going to show that 93% of the HR directors need people with international experience, while only 10% of those same companies actually require language at the entry level. That's the contradiction that Mary uh, was getting at just now. And I think we've just got to raise awareness um, that uh, you don't add that language at some later point. Right. Kirsten Brecht added, um, added, added a comment to Mary's uh, question. She said, we have proved that industry and employers do care about their language skills and their cultural competency. However, many of the global companies looking for these skills are sourcing in different venues, mostly because they think they have to make a binary choice. 
they think they have to either hire for industry skills or for language skills. And the next sentence um, 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 kind of breaks, as she says, as we educate employers about the growing prevalence of candidates with the combinations of the skills, they being two, and that's why it, um, well, I mean, Kirsten is exactly on target there, and uh, exactly, we can't blame all of this just on HR and entry level, because the fact is that the talent in the past has not always been there. And one of you in the early questions that you've been, you shared with me this morning, one of you commented that don't businesses really just hire natives, don't they just hire locals? Uh, in part, yes, they do. Uh, they, that's a good idea to hire locals. Uh, but you also need uh, Americans, uh, uh, American-born uh, uh, managers overseas in some situations. Uh, and in some cases, if you're going to protect the culture of the company, you have to make sure that there's a strong American management. Or it won't be an American company when you go to visit it. It'll be, it'll be another kind of company. Uh, but I think to come back to Kirsten's point, uh, there, uh, our, our, our HR people have not exactly been spoiled by an abundance of talent rushing in the door with language skills. And many of them, as she correctly says, just assume that I either got to hire a computer programmer or an accountant, or I find somebody with language. We need people with both, and uh, that, that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. We have one uh, sort of practical question and one clarif clarification. Ala Kurova uh, asks to explain, because the connection was bad, uh, what you meant by saying that Russian is officially on the college board. Um, I'm not sure I do um, what what you mean uh, here. I, 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 but could you repeat what you just said because I'm not sure I understand I still so Allah wrote would you please explain the phrase you said at the beginning of your presentation about now Russian is officially on the college board oh yes uh, that, that's not quite what I said but if you look at the college board website go to AP and there you will see the published endorsement of the Newell Russian test. That is Russian, Arabic, uh, Portuguese, and Korean are now up and uh, endorsed by the college board for advanced placement and credit by exam. That's what I was getting at. And so if, um, uh, if, that, if you don't know that information already, uh, and uh, please, please take that into account. And if you have any questions at all about, uh, we have, a, for example, a, 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 a Russian, what we call the Newell AP uh, uh, development, professional development seminar here on the weekend of the 22nd of October. Uh, and any Russian teacher who hasn't done this before but would like to offer uh, the, the Newell AP in, um, in their um, uh, school, uh, this is a wonderful thing to come and learn all about how to do it. Mm -hmm. And Olga asks for your advice, um, what can students do after one semester of College Russian in terms of study abroad? What would be your um, recommendation uh, from your experience? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking around at, at, at my colleagues at this point because we have an increasing number of courses. I'm looking at Graham right now uh, for students with smaller amounts of language, right? and even a few for those that haven't yet started the study of Russian. We used to not do that. But Graham, are there any that you would recommend for students that are still kind of in the novice range? Is there a, a useful program they might take that would spark their interest and make them want to continue? Well, we run a couple of programs that are taught, the, the, the majority of the content courses are taught in English, and then they provide Russian language instruction at any level. Oh. Oh. Okay. So those include the ECAP program, the PC Security program, Contemporary Study, Contemporary Russia. Those are all programs where students don't have to have any Russian to go, but they can learn Russian while they're on the program and they're in an immersion setting and they're exposed to a lot of Russian in Japan. Students at really any proficiency level can go. So you can go with no Russian or you can go with fairly advanced Russian and you'll still be taught at whatever level. That's beautiful. Beautiful. I think that's exactly what our question was getting. And could you please repeat the names of the programs? Because it was. Um, uh, if you want to come around and say that, uh, or, or if you can go, the, uh, no, go ahead. They're a peace and security program. Um, uh, <laughs> Energy in Central Asia, uh, and Contemporary Russia are three. Mm -hmm. And they, and you can find more information about those on the on the American uh, Council Study Abroad website. There, there, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But th these are relatively new offerings, and uh, they, they will actually give 
training right on the spot for and picking up if somebody's had a semester they probably some they might be a novice mid right uh, if, depending on how many contact hours they've had but there's some kind of a novice and they can certainly pick up from there in the in the uh, sort of local language training as well as do something substantive which is actually credit bearing am I, am I right right so you see the student is not coming back to Tom's point the student's not giving up credit. They'll actually get transferable academic credit for that course as they build their Russian language and do a course, and it'll be a peace studies course or an energy uh, clean environment studies or, or one of the others, or just contemporary Russian society. So I hope, I hope we ask, answered all of this question. Right. Uh, okay. Viewers ask for a, a link uh, that we can send them by email to this program, so to the page on the American Councils, and I think we can do that. I, I have uh, just uh, two more questions. I think we are almost done here. So Nadia Brukovic asks, what service learning possibilities are available for students of Russia in the U.S.? If you know of any service learning possibilities. It, for service learning here in the United States or service learning yes. overseas? In the, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. Yeah, I hesitate to do that. I know that each uh, at, at Bryn Mawr, we have worked out uh, over the years two primary service learning options, uh, and I, that didn't have to be something that Kayla did be sitting here right now. Uh, one is in the, uh, but we have a substantial Russian-speaking uh, Slavic community in Northeast Philadelphia with very large numbers of older citizens, uh, recent immigrants, uh, who are Russian speaking, and that has everything to do with oral histories, uh, with uh, uh, just giving help. Uh, those those have been very rewarding for our students. And the other one is working in uh, Zolotoy Kluchik as this school. There's a couple of Russian uh, heritage schools in our neighborhood. Uh, but I think you know if you if your school or your university is in a place where there are heritage populations, you don't have to wait. For someone else to go set that up, we we kind of just did it locally. Uh, uh, American Councils doesn't actually operate in uh, a lot here. We do have certainly have service learning opportunities overseas, uh, along with um, volunteer opportunities and internships, uh, and those those are carefully coordinated with local hosts and supervisors so that the students' language ability and past experience is carefully articulated. I think I'll give you just one example of an overseas. We had a young woman on flagship year before last who had worked before this and in, in a uh, helpline for battered women. She was, she's young, but she knew how to do this. She had done it in Portland, Oregon for several years. And uh, she asked to be placed as a helpline respondent in Almaty, Kazakhstan for battered women there. And she carried out that work with amazing facility. And I, I was such an unusual example of service and an internship that I actually went to the center myself and sat there and met with her and her supervisor for the better part of well, half, a, half a day uh, just to just understand better how that all worked. So uh, I, I would say that for, you know, for Russian and for service learning, you know, the sky is the limit here from both, you know, just sort of self-designed local voluntary initiatives um, uh, in schools and, and uh, homes for the aged where there's great need uh, to, um, uh, to overseas sort of high, high stakes overseas uh, positions as well. Thank you. And we're almost, we're near in our 5.30 um, mark, but um, Natalia Kaloyden asks you a very simple question. Um, what are the, uh, is it possible to overcome differences between public schools, language programs in, at university level? <laughs> I know I'll just take your <laughs> 20 yeah. seconds to answer. No, no, this is, this is really important. Uh, the articulation of school to college Russian uh, is, is so absolutely important. That's why we've devoted almost 15 years around here, the first to develop the prototype AP and to, uh, and, and to uh, that now, which is now called either prototype AP, if that's what you call it, or Newell Russian, the National Exam in World Languages dash Russian, which is the way the College Board refers to it. Um, uh, there, there is an extraordinary value in providing the articulation mechanisms for high school students whatever kind of program they've come through, uh, whether it's been a highly elaborated 
four-year program with overseas components, uh, as some of some of your programs have, uh, to the kind of startup high school program that's only kind of getting on its feet and has a couple of years so far. Uh, it doesn't really matter where a student is. They should understand that if you've started the study of Russian in middle school, in primary school, or in secondary school, uh, wherever you are in your learning, that counts. That, that is worth something. If you can demonstrate a minimal level of proficiency, maybe it's only novice high, uh, but that novice high can get you placed in some institutions into second year Russian, in the other institutions, including my own, in the, in the second semester Russian. Uh, if you're a little better than novice high, if you're in the inter intermediate range, then you can get advanced placement, in some cases, maybe even credit toward graduation uh, for that amount of measured, uh, measured language skill. Again, however, if you're a heritage learner and maybe you haven't had uh, any formal training in the language, but you were able to demonstrate that proficiency, uh, the idea is not to drop it, uh, but to uh, demonstrate it and, and, and use it and see the continuation of your language as a positive value. It can get you into a college or a university you might not have thought of. Uh, you, you can demonstrate proficiency in any critical language. I can assure you there are dozens of, a couple of dozen research universities in this country that are suddenly going to get interested in you. Uh, so uh, it should be motivating to the students to stay with their language demonstrate the best possible proficiency, and then get that information out there uh, as part of your college application process. Make sure that the host universities know you have this, 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 this uh, language knowledge. Again, whatever, whatever it is, and however you got it, uh, don't hide it. Uh, stay with it, and uh, it'll lead somewhere. Uh, that's almost Evgeny like a planted question, wasn't it? I didn't know that was coming. Uh, but that's, uh, that's probably not a bad note for us to end on. Yeah. Okay, I think we ran out of time, uh, but I think it was extremely uh, useful and interesting. Thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you, audience. Thank you for all your questions. Um, uh, the uh, audience uh, members asked Dan for the PowerPoint of your, um, of your presentation. Um, okay, exactly. You, you, you just work with us, make sure we know how to get you that and the link that, that, that one of the questioners asked for as well. Right. Absolutely. Right. Send, it, send it up to you. We got it right here. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you all for tuning in and giving us so much time. Thank you a lot.